I sound like someone who kidnaps people in Liam Neeson movies. You can call me Nico Belich plus plus. Today we are gonna take a look at Luanti aka Mindtest aka open source Minecraft on steroids. If you are looking to improve your coding skills, software architecture knowledge or need some fresh C++ inspiration, this project has it all. The focus of this video will be on the software architecture side, but we will make an occasional trip to the source code with source trail. We are gonna take a look at the software architecture of the engine, basic data structures and some other interesting things. Things. If you want to support the channel hit like and subscribe and if you want to help me pay rent you can become a Patreon or YouTube member. And before we start I want to say a big thank you to VRL Petku, David Jeskowski and Dr. Slothev. Ok let's go. When you say software architecture most people think about this. This is not software architecture, this is a diagram. Besides the fact that most diagrams do not even follow proper UML syntax. Software architecture isn't just boxes and arrows, it's the set of decisions that drive software development. And I could give you another 10 definitions of software architecture, but most important thing for you to remember is, it is not just some diagrams. Now, software documentation, which also includes architecture, is strictly regulated in industries like aerospace, automotive, naval and medical devices for example. These fields must comply with standards such as DO178, common criteria, ASPICE or SPICE, CCC or FDA and CE regulations in Europe for example. Now before going through the software architecture of this specific project, I want to break down to you my thought process. And as you know, I don't like complicating things and flexing on some beginners, so I'm gonna use very simple lingo in case someone from Stack Overflow feels offended. So everything starts with an idea, in our case we want to make a game. Now let's assume we don't know what Minecraft is. I mean when I hear the word mine it remembers me of my homeland and landmines. Then we start breaking down our idea into high level requirements. So for example first we want to build a 3D world that's built out of blocks. So we can type in 3D blocks world. Then we want to have a player character and you should be able to dig, build and generally speaking interact with the environment. So this is our player. And then the last one is we want the game to have a single player mode and a multiplayer online mode. So single player plus multiplayer online. Now, each of these high level concepts of the game can be refined into more detailed concepts and requirements. For example, the map should be randomly generated, or everything should be built out of voxels. A voxel is the three dimensional counterpart of a pixel, okay? Now, when it comes to software architecture, we differentiate between two perspectives on a system. So we have the static view. And we have the dynamic view. Without going into too much detail now, the static view describes the components, the building blocks, and the dynamic view describes the runtime behavior, how the components interact with each other over time. Okay, so this is our general premise of the game. Everything here is on a very high level, we are not talking about assets, data types, structures, networking, level generation and so on. Now let's go through the software architecture of Luanti. So Luanti contains three main components and modules. The server, the client and the main menu. So the server runs the server side logic, the client runs the graphics, controls and logic for a single player and the main menu is displayed before joining a game. So when playing a game there must always be a server. A single player game will run the client and server in the same process but on different threads. And remote games will have a client running locally which then connects to a server running remotely. Now let's take a look at the diagram from the project documentation. Okay, so first let's hide this and center it. Now if you take a look at this diagram, we see on the left side the server subsystem and its components. And on the right side you see the client subsystem and its components. There is no legend in this diagram, but let me make an educated guess. So the rectangles are components, 
these cylinder type of things are databases, the rectangles with round edges are actions, and these diagonal things are some kind of metadata stuff or something that can't really be categorized. Now, besides the client and server subsystem, as I call them, we have the environment, which can't be explicitly seen as a component here, but the environment contains stuff like map, nodes, players, objects, and other stuff. Both client and server have an environment, and the environment is updated in a specific time interval. This time interval is called the environment step. Now, the map is a container of these map blocks, which we can see here. And a map block contains 16 times 16 times 16 nodes, static objects and metadata. And at the top, we can see this unilateral communication from the server side to the client side with access, dev screen, add node, remove node. And in the other direction, we have stuff like dig, place, hit, damage, and so on. So we can say that the server communicates all the map manipulation stuff to the client and the client communicates the player actions to the server which then of course manipulates the elements of the map now the question is why do we need the environment on both sides i guess and if you watched my quake prediction video you will remember the concept of client side prediction so let me try to explain it very briefly when the client performs an action, it updates the on-screen game state immediately without waiting for the server acknowledgement. And once the server responds, the game continues as normal if the states match, and if the states don't match, a state reconciliation process is triggered. But now if we zoom out for a moment, if we go back to our game high-level requirements, if we, let's say, define the requirement at the beginning differently, let's say the game should be single player mode only, this would have a major impact on the software architecture. Why? There would be no need for a client server architecture like we have here, okay? I mean, you can design it in an infinite amount of ways, but there are standard approaches which have been proven to work. And stay with me now, I'm gonna share with you some OG software business wisdom. There is no need to reinvent the wheel. In some of my previous videos, I said, don't reinvent the wheel and people started fighting in the comment section. What I mean is, there is no point in reinventing the wheel in sections that don't give you competitive advantage on the market. The end user does not care if I did my own re-implementation of the Ethernet protocol. Why should I invest time in something that's not a market differentiating factor? Reinvent the wheel when it comes to competitive advantage and take off the shelf solutions when it does not give you an advantage. Let me give you an example. Let's say I want to invent a new car feature and get it on the market. Now, I can start by coding an own real-time operating system, designing the hardware myself, and then coding the application layer myself. This will take me three years. Or I can get off-the-shelf solutions for the hardware, a real-time operating system, and then just code my application and get it done in one year. Now, if I take the three years route, I'm risking that my competition has shorter time to market and will get all the sales, even though my product is slightly better. So the development time is a huge factor if you want to create products that actually make money. Because at the end of the day, the end user does not care if your product is 0.5 seconds faster, but then also costs 10 times as much and he needs to wait another year to get it. Now, let me repeat it. Reinvent the wheel where it matters. Don't reinvent something that does not give you any competitive advantage. Okay, now back to this diagram. So in conclusion, from a very high level perspective, the general architecture looks like this. I can't see the main menu on this diagram right now, but it's probably somewhere in here. But generally speaking, we have a client side, a server side, and they communicate with each other by exchanging information about the environment and players. And each of those run on separate threads, but in the same process. 
and I'm now talking about the single player mode, okay? And under the hood, both server and client run their own components or managers, for example, node manager, sound manager, and so on. Now, this is a very high level view. Of course, I could go now and make an hour long video for each component to cover everything on every abstraction level, it would probably take over 80 hours of material. But now let's go to source trail. The tool I'm using my videos is called source trail. You can Google it. It's open source. It is free and you can use it to visualize projects. On the right side, we can see some stats. So the project has over a thousand files and over a over 350,000 lines of code. Now what I'm interested in is the server. Uh, not the namespace, but server.h. Let's minimize this and take a look. So on the right side is everything that's included by server.h. And on the left side, you see everything that includes server.h. And now if I expand this again, I can see that... Um, no, 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 no. We can find the server class. It's in here. And now you can see all the dependencies in the server class. And now we can send this to our IDE, which is Visual Studio Code. And we can take a look at the server source code. Now the server class inherits from peer handler, map event receiver, and iGame dev. And the client class also inherits from iGame dev, which is an interface for fetching game global definitions like tool and map node properties. Okay, it says every public method should be thread safe. And then we can see that the actual processing is done in another thread. This is run by a server thread. Okay, so we have the class server and then we have probably a class called server thread, which does the actual processing. Then we have all the handles handle command. Okay, so these functions handle all the commands that come in from client or player, like for example, damage or chat message, delete blocks, and so on. And now the interesting part is what you can see here is they always exchange this network packet. The network packet, and I don't want to drift too deep down again in the code, but let's take a look at it. Okay, yeah. So the network packet reminds me of the Quake net channel header. If you remember, I also made a video about that, about the Quake net channel header, where a UDP frame is wrapped in the that channel header, which then contains stuff like session IDs and so on. In Quake, they used it to be able to acknowledge UDP frames since they did not want to use TCP because of the TCP overhead. But okay, now let's take a look at client. Okay, so again, it's very similar to the server. We have client.h which then defines the client class and if we expand this we can send it to the IDE client.h. Now as I mentioned they both inherit from iGainDev and it says nothing is thread safe here. Okay that's different than in the server class and then if we scroll down yeah as you can see the client also defines all the command handles and it works with network packets. But generally speaking, everything in here is very pleasant to read. Now let's take a look at the basic data structures, which again, if you go back to software architecture, it falls into the category static view. So let's open this again. So the basic building block in Luanti and Minecraft is this cubic shape, which they call node. Let's give it some color. Make this thicker, the thicker the better, you know the rule. The architectural decision in this case would be to have a world which is built out of blocks or cubes or nodes or whatever you want to call them, okay? And now one can define requirements for these nodes or boundary conditions such as only one node can exist at a particular position in the 3D grid or that nodes can only be placed at whole number coordinates. And then we can define player interactions with the node, such as the player should be able to break the node, place nodes to change the environment, and so on. 
Then we can define that we want to have different types of nodes, like nodes for water, air, dirt, stone, and so on. Now, all these requirements will influence how we design the node then. I mean, if you want to exchange a lot of node information between the client and server, then it makes absolute sense to create the nodes in such a way to be very lightweight in data, okay? What they also did in Luanti, they defined a superset of nodes which is called map block. So a map block in Luanti is a 16 times 16 times 16 collection of nodes, okay? So imagine this is now 16, 16, 16. And then they defined also a superset of map blocks, which they call map chunks, which is five times five times five map blocks. And finally, they define the map, I'm gonna make it in a different color, which then stores all the map blocks. And additionally, it contains all the functionality for saving and loading of the map blocks. Now let's take a quick look in source trail. Let's go to home. So first let's take a look at node. We can hide the code window. Okay. So node looks very simple. Let's take a look at map block. Map block is a class which is a lot more complicated than node. And okay. And then finally we have map class, which should be a superset of map blocks. Okay, we can see here a dependency to client map, inheritance, server map, also inheritance. And now if we click at this member node definition, you can see how client map and server map interact with this definition. They both use the node def. Okay, now let's take a look at evolution of the map generator. Luanti comes with several built-in map generators. And by the way, this is the official Luanti documentation wiki. And I can only recommend it. It is full of really valuable information. It has even tutorials on different topics if someone's interested. Okay, but let's go back to the map generator. So when creating a world in Luanti, you can pick which map generator you want to use. And most of them use Perlin noise. If you remember my last videos, Perlin noise is something often used in map generators. But Luanti also offers you the possibility to create your own map generator, which in my opinion is a great opportunity if someone just wants to practice and try to create his own map generator. And Luanti didn't start with the map generator that we now have. It has gone through many versions and changes and fine tuning. So that just shows how projects grow over time. What I want you to remember from this section is even if you don't know 100% how something is done you should just start with the things you know and go from there and just focus to improve step by step don't beat yourself because you can't program the perfect map generator or anything from the jump can't make a 3d game start with a 2d game just start Okay, so generally speaking, this was an extremely well-documented project and very pleasant to read. If you want to experiment with some source code, try to make your own mod, I would highly recommend Luanti. So, that's it for today. If you like the content, hit like and subscribe and see you in the next one. Tariq Tanex.